heads. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to give you honor and to give you praise and to give thanks for the beautiful gift of your son who is no longer dead and in a tomb but has resurrected and is alive even now. We thank you for his presence that is here among us. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would quicken our senses, our hearts, our bodies, and our mind to be more aware of your presence. That every distraction will be removed and that our minds will be still enough and our hearts still enough to receive your word for us today. That we would be transformed in our encounter with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's message is entitled, Living Witness. And uh, I want to read something to you. Uh, there was a gentleman who was driving, and he ended up getting rear-ended from behind by another vehicle. Um, he swerved off. He almost hit the vehicle in front of him. And they ended up hitting a, a pole, an electricity pole, and uh, some of the wires came down. So there was some live current. Um, but he made it out okay. And um, that's pretty much the end of the story. So how many of you think that you could read what I just finished reading to you? Raise your hand if you think that's not too hard to handle. Right? Oh, I just showed you that there was nothing on there. Um, well, there's a big difference between what I just told you and what the gentleman who experienced is about to tell you. So just uh, have a little laugh, but at the same time, there's a big difference. And I uh, want to just play this real quick for you. Well, I was just driving uh, down uh, Northern Avenue, getting ready to pull into Albertsons. And uh, all of a sudden, I was just minding my own business. Bam! Hit me hard right from the back. I was glued to my seat. I was like, whoa! I could see the car in front of me. I was about to hit him. So I kind of veered off this way. And as I veered off this way, the guy who hit me veered off that other way. And he hit the curb, flipped over, rolled over, run into the electrical pole. And I didn't know he hit the pole. All of a sudden, I kind of stopped. And I was like, whoa! And the, the wires come down. Boom! And then arc, arc, bam! That fire was coming everywhere. It was arcing, sparking, blowing up. I saw one arc, arc go from the corner of my van up to the car behind me. It was like a big rainbow. Boom! And it was coming up. Boom! Boom! And I was like, Gee! So I, I opened up my door. I didn't touch no metal. And as I come up, I started to touch the top. And a little spark jumped up. I was like, whoa! I, I stepped out the rest of the way. Lucky I didn't get burned more. So, crazy. Oh, it was crazy, dude. Totally out of the blue. I mean, it was. I was just sitting there, and I was like, oh! Reality hits you hard, bro. Guy's still stuck in there. Guy's still stuck in there, and uh, his car is still hot. So uh, the fire department's not going to go in until after. All right. So a little bit different, right? Hearing it from him versus what I just read. Because he was actually there. He actually witnessed it. He was reporting from the scene itself. It was live. It was direct. And you notice, I, I had to look at my paper to tell you the story. I had to kind of get my facts together make sure I was reading it right, but he didn't have to do any preparation for that. Nobody had to uh, tell him ahead of time, hey, make sure you get excited about this. Make sure you use a lot of emotion about this. Um, did you get all your facts straight? Nobody had to do any of that because all he was, he was just in the right place. Well, not really, but in the right place at the right time. And all he was simply doing was sharing what he's experiencing. Big difference than what I did. You see, I, what I did, I could pass on, and anybody here can do it. But what he just did, only that man could tell you the way he did, and with such dramatization as he did. <laughs> but it's a living reality for him. It was real. In Acts 1.8, Jesus tells his disciples, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Today I want to talk to you about living witnesses. 
I heard a statement recently. Someone said, the Lord's not trying to win the world by witnessing. He's trying to win the world through witnesses. Big difference. And being that this is a weekend that we're celebrating the risen Christ, the living Jesus, I find it's appropriate that we maybe re-examine, are we doing witnessing or are we living witnesses? Because as we just saw in the little example, there's a huge difference. Are we simply passing a paper on to someone else? Hey, read this, check this out. Or are we alive from the living experience with the living Christ and we're simply an overflow of that encounter and that experience that we're having with him? Huge, huge, huge difference. What I love about this, though, is these men had spent three and a half years walking with Jesus. Not just walking with Jesus. They actually witnessed miracle after miracle. People being raised from the dead. People being healed just by touching his garment. If there were any men on the planet at this point who had enough stories to tell about Jesus, it was these guys. So a lot of us would have said, well, you know what? That in itself qualified them to be witnesses. But Jesus didn't tell them, hey guys, now that you've been with me three and a half years, go ahead and tell everybody what it was like to walk with me. No, he still said, no, that's not enough to qualify you. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes. Then you'll be a witness for me. You see, it's always been the Lord's way to where witnesses are ongoing overflows of living experiences with the living God. Not just the recounting or reciting of a walk that you once had with him. If that was the case, they would have qualified already. They already spent three and a half years with him. But Jesus didn't want them ministering out of head knowledge or what they once experienced by walking with the Lord. He didn't want them just telling people, hey, this is what it was like when we walked with the Lord. Instead, he wanted his presence to be poured out because it was to continue. Their walk with him, experience with him, wasn't finishing when he ascended. It was going to continue, in fact, even magnify as now that same spirit that was in him and that they loved to have among them could now come and actually be inside of them and walk with them. Jesus understood that it wasn't enough that they simply go out and say what they once did by walking with Jesus. But he knew they had to be living witnesses of the living Christ. And that meant his presence was not an addition, but it was the absolute vital requirement before going anywhere to tell anybody. You see, witnessing is not that difficult. I could coordinate something here this afternoon and every single person in here can go and if I give you a little paper like this and say, hey, just say these words. We're going to go for an hour. We're going to feed the homeless. We're going to visit some elderly folks. There's nothing wrong with those things. Those things are amazing. But the reality is every person here could easily turn a witnessing switch on and take this piece of paper and we can go sing some, some songs, etc., make some people happy, which is great. And then when we're finished, after we've taken some photos and posted them on Facebook, gotten a few likes, a few, oh, praise the Lord, then we go home, we turn the switch off. And we're done with our witnessing for the day. It's not hard to go down the street or to travel anywhere in the 10-mile radius and find witnessing taking place every week. But that's not what he said here. He said that we would be witnesses. Witnesses. And witnesses are only produced in the presence of God and in a constant awareness of who he is. And witnesses don't just speak out of knowledge of a past experience, but we are simply overflowing with what we are experiencing and inviting others to experience the same. The living presence of the living Christ is vital and the moment we sever ourselves from an active experience with the Lord, all we've become is just carriers of a piece of paper and we're passing it on to people. And then we wonder why they're not as excited as we are. There's more that the Lord has invited us to in being his witnesses. In 1 John, it says here, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Look how many times you're going to see the word heard and seen which we have seen with our eyes, 
which we have looked upon and our hands, inf- and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness, present tense, and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. Well, why do we want to have fellowship with you? Because truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, if he had just stopped here, we could easily say, well, that's easy for you to say, John, you're John the Beloved. You're the disciple whom Jesus loved. Of course you have seen him. Of course you've heard him. That's not fair, John. You have such an advantage that we don't have, and how are we going to be witnesses to? And really, it would put them at a different advantage point than what we have today. But he didn't stop there. He said, yeah, because of that, it opened up a way for us to have present tense fellowship, communion with the Father and Son. Therefore, that you also may have fellowship with us. Do you see the difference? He's inviting them not to merely hear a story about a resurrected Savior, but to actually participate in the living fellowship that they were still experiencing with the living Savior. It had never stopped. It just intensified even more. Then Peter, this is after he's being questioned, after a man has been restored to full health, a man that from birth had been lame, never walked. And Peter is now being questioned about the miracle. He's, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what it means to be filled? It means there's no capacity in us that's absent or void of the Spirit's presence. No empty cavern, no empty room in our heart, in our life, No room that says, sorry, not interested. Come back later. Do not disturb. None of that. Full accessibility to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have the very presence of God, full-fledged presence of God possessing us. And he said to them, in that place, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, By what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you've crucified, which God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. Recounting what happened, past tense, but then says, and this is what's happening, present tense. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter. Well, what were they seeing? Well, he was seeing the Holy Spirit possessing a man, a living witness. They saw it, and they said, they saw Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men and marveled. Didn't make any sense. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. But that's actually not even it. They were actually... In body, they actually had the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ in them. It wasn't that they had just a memory of walking with Jesus. The very same Spirit that was in Jesus, the very same Spirit that resurrected him was now living inside of them. But the only thing they could wrap their minds around was, well, man, the only time we've seen something like this was when, they were, when Jesus was here. Because there they were, bringing forefront and center the very presence of a living God. And it says, and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Why was this man made whole? Because what they carried was the very presence of God. And as living witnesses, who not just one time walked with Jesus, but who were living a life of constantly walking with Jesus, simply imparted what they were full of into this man, and the same power of the living Christ 
hit him and restored him, and there he was, the full proof, full evidence, right in front of their faces that the same Jesus is still ministering. Evidence in which they could say nothing against. See, a piece of paper is really easy to turn down. Somebody comes to you, hands it. Here, read this. No, no, I'm not interested. But you have a man here who from birth was lame and all of a sudden is alive walking with you. It leaves people speechless who would normally accuse, who would normally oppose because the presence of the living Christ is evident through a living witness. Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, that the world may believe that you sent me, that the world may believe that you sent me. Notice the prerequisite. Being a witness, a living witness, that the world may believe you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. How does this perfection or completeness take place as we are Acknowledge and recognize and receive the union in which his death and resurrection ushered us into. Being one with the Father, with the Son. And that the world may know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me. He said... I'm sending you out as witnesses. Witnesses. Not, I'm sending you out witnessing. I'm sending you out as witnesses. Do you know that we could only impart to a person whatever percentage of ourselves that we've accepted in this experience with the Lord. As far as being a living witness, we could only testify as that man did in the beginning to whatever extent we are currently drawing in our experience from the Lord. He tells us that if we truly receive this, just like he's mentioning here, the world will believe that we have a risen Savior. They'll believe that he's alive. They'll have not one man, but many men that are healed and restored, staring right at him as proof, hey, this living Christ, he still is alive. But are we satisfied with just witnessing? Because see, the standard of man is extremely low. And it's very easy to be following that standard and saying, well, you know what, guys? I mean, we did what we did, right? We we went. I mean, look at the pictures. Weren't you there? I got a T-shirt. We we, we did witnessing. Isn't that enough? Didn't we do it? Check. Okay, Lord, come. We're waiting. But that's not it. Witnesses. 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 The living Christ. We have a weekend here that's so powerful. It's a celebration of a risen Savior. And you know, there is countless programs all over taking place today and tomorrow. Countless. Recount, recounting the story of Jesus who rose. But can people encounter, encounter the living Christ, the power in which he clearly displayed, in which every living witness imparted to others? 
Can they just find another program? Or can they actually experience a touch from the living God? Because people can forget a program, but it's really hard to shake a touch from the living God. It's really hard to now be walking when you were laying your entire life and forget about the powerful Savior who is alive. See, we want Jesus to come back, right? I mean, the world is, we see the world, it's getting terrible. But we can go to a corner and, and pray ourselves in numbness and say, Lord, please come back for us and neglect such a wonderful gospel that we have, such a wonderful Savior who is alive and who desires to be our prized possession above all else. What would happen if even just you sitting there, me being here, walked out of here today and said, you know what, Lord, I'm tired of just giving you 30%, 50%, 90%, whatever it is. I truly have settled for less, Lord. I truly have plateaued. But your word is very clear that the people in my path, the people in your path, will believe they will see a living testimony of him if we would only just resign from our own standards, our own misperceptions, our own belief of what's, what's, what the Lord is really calling us to and say, no, I want to live from a living revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, what made Jesus so powerful in entire ministry and life, it was that he never ministered just purely out of head knowledge. He's always spending time with the Father to know the heart of the Father. And in fact, he said, I only do what I've seen him do. I only say what I've seen him say. But are we quick to speak? Do we feel we have a knowledge that is not needing the presence of God to really empower. But let's just throw on what we think can work or, or put on a program, which programs are amazing, don't get me wrong. But let me ask you this. If we're doing worship, and let's say all the mics just get cut off, how quickly do we get distracted? Come on, I'm guilty of it too. We'll look around. Aline, what is going on? Microphones are messing up. If all the lights shut off, the cameras went, the live feed went, would that ruin our day? Would that ruin what we're here to experience? What is our expectation for coming here? What is it that we've come here to do? Is it just to talk to each other? Is it just to, to, to entertain one another? Or have we actually come with the expectancy that today we are going to experience and meet the living God? Today we're going to encounter him. Today, we're going to see a fresh revelation of who he is that we've yet to see. Guys, he's the most fascinating individual in the entire universe. And with the veil being torn open and his resurrection already happening, already done, there is absolutely no reason that we should ever believe a lie, ever settle for less than a life that Jesus modeled a life where we're constantly receiving fresh revelation from the Father, fresh revelation from Jesus. You know, the Lord loves to birth ideas and birth things into our hearts. He loves to, to birth certain things, certain revelations about himself, and then send his spirit to empower it, to breathe on it, to bring it to life. See, Jesus lived constantly in that place. There was not one stale sermon he shared. There wasn't one stale teaching that he ministered from. He never got to a point where he said, well, I've preached so many times, I'll just, I'll just use this. No, it was vital for him. He said, I will not do 90% of the Father's will and neglect 10%. I won't neglect even 1%. I refuse to speak or do unless it's directly out of the presence of God. And a living witness 
comes to a point where they realize this whole thing is only as valuable as I place value in what the Lord has invited me to. A life sitting at the feet of Jesus. Mary and Martha, prime examples. Martha was busy getting the, getting the thing ready, right? Cleaning the dishes, getting the house ready. Jesus was sitting there. You know, a lot of us would have looked at that scenario and said, man, Mary's kind of lazy. You know, she's not helping out. Martha's doing all the work. Come on, Mary, get up. Let's get to work. Eventually, Martha tells her that, and Jesus says, no. Mary's chosen the right thing. Sitting at my feet receiving from me. Her interest was if Jesus was in the room, there was absolutely nothing more important than being with him, than hearing from him, than learning from him. I wonder what would happen if all the activity that you and I think is valuable or think is important or even, even the means of which we consider witnessing to our community is important. If we were to submit all that stuff and prioritize it the way Mary did, And say, you know what, there's nothing like being with him. There's nothing like growing with him. There's nothing like walking and talking with him. There's nothing that like like living a life of just overflow of being with him. How would that change what we do? How would that be empowered by the living reality of Jesus in us? We won't have to merely recount a story of a Savior who once resurrected, we would actually be the embodying power of his presence that is resurrected. We would be a place, an individual, a body that they know these are living witnesses. His presence is there, his presence is alive, his presence is real, and there's fruit coming as a result that only could be described as from Jesus. What would happen if whatever percentage in my heart and your heart that has settled for being, doing witnessing was surrendered up today, was resigned today, and saying, Lord, I want to be a living witness. I want to be a living witness. Living witness. Whatever part of our day that we're so used to pushing the Lord aside for, whatever percentage, whether it be at work, whatever we're doing, that we say, Lord, I want to be a living witness. What would happen to our families, to our workplaces, to our church? We don't come here to merely talk about the Lord. The Lord wants to so invade this house and our lives that our expectancy is blown through the roof every week that we come here that every every time whatever predictability is in your life and my life i guarantee you the living presence of god hasn't been able to touch that part yet but it's okay because you have an invitation just like i do today to let him in those areas it should be the most exciting Like that man, he was excited about a car accident. That's something bad, right? But man, he just told that story with such life. Boom, boom, ah, blah, you know. But here we are with the resurrected Savior, a veil that's torn, that says, come with boldness to the throne of the living God of the universe. And yet we have to pep each other up sometimes to witness No. I believe the Lord is drawing us as sons and daughters into a merry relationship with him that resigns all of our activities that we've believed is is work or witnessing and instead have finally sat in a position of rest at the feet of the Lord and say, you know what, Lord? I'm not going about my day without receiving a fresh revelation from you. And in fact, even after I receive that, I'm going to continue walking with you through this day, being aware aware of your presence this day. 
Because the quality of what comes out of our mouth when it's fresh in the presence of God has far greater eternal weight on the ears of the person that's in front of us and in their heart. It penetrates walls, things that are naturally impossible for head knowledge or intellect to comprehend. But it's supernatural because it's empowered by the very presence of God himself. Jesus modeled what a son and daughter who's redeemed walks like, looks like, lives like, then invites us and says, be my witnesses. Well, Jesus, how do we be your witness? Never stop being with me. Never do a moment of life without me. Never make decisions without seeking what my heart might be saying about that. But living at the feet of Jesus as John the Beloved on the very heart of the Lord. Resting from that place. Living witnesses of a risen Savior who is alive. We're going to wash feet in remembrance of the Lord's act of humility and of really cleansing in which he exemplified and then we're going to partake of communion. But before our brain switches into that mode, because we've done it many times, we've all washed feet, we've all done communion, let's lean in in a way that we haven't perhaps before, not being concerned about our neighbor to the left, neighbor to the right, but simply saying, Lord, I don't want to just do this out of tradition. I don't want to just do this because it's Easter I want to have expectancy that when I wash my neighbor's feet, my brother's feet, and I receive the washing from them, that I would let your Holy Spirit move my heart and touch me in such a way that brings the living reality of what's happening forefront and center. That you would take my mind into even thinking about what it was like to have feet washed by Jesus to receive such service that only a slave would have typically done. And when I take communion today, Lord, I don't want to just take it and just read the scripture that, that we, we read with the, with the communion, but rather I want to allow myself to rest and be released, to be touched and receive a touch from you. And when I take that bread and when I drink that grape juice, that will let your spirit minister to me and that your presence will consume me and transform me. Everything that we do, guys, is meant to be in the presence. When we step outside of it, it becomes religious activity, void of presence and power to change. It becomes monotonous, it becomes predictable. But in the presence, it's transforming, and there's new revelation every single time. And like that man, you'll be living from that place, not relying on the revelation you once had, the encounter you once had with the Lord, not even on the three and a half years like the disciples had. Jesus said, nope, that's not enough. You got to actually have a life in my presence, even after I leave, and witness from that place. See, they had the embodied Christ that they walked with. They said, that's what I've seen, that's what I've heard. But he sent his spirit. And if there's ever a time of union between God and man, it's now. That the spirit of God can actually live inside of a mortal like you and me. In which Paul says, if the same spirit that resurrected that body of Jesus from the dead now lives in you, now lives in me, then surely, as living witnesses, we are constantly sharing the fresh revelation that we are receiving from our living Savior. Father, 
with our affections turned to you and our hearts and spirit in a position to receive. We ask that your presence would intensify, that our minds won't interfere and think of things in a predictable way, but that even now you would quicken each of our hearts as if this was the very first time we've ever experienced communion. Because you're a God that is inexhaustible and you love to amaze your children with the wonders of who you are. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you break our man-made ceilings down. The things that we've built out of habit out of pure tradition. The things that perhaps we've even used as fillers in place of where your presence should be. And we say, Father, have your way. We say, Holy Spirit, draw us into communion with you. That we would realize what we're doing is actually receiving from the Lord. That we would believe you for what you say regarding these things. That they're not just mere sacraments or items. But they're to draw us into the living reality of the living Christ. We celebrate your resurrection, Jesus. And we thank God that death could not hold you. Move us into a greater intimacy with you that we would never settle for mere witnessing but instead seek to be your living witnesses to this earth. That our bodily temples would be vacant for you to fill and only you. That any desires there that are keeping you from having the full of us would be surfaced and removed today as your spirit touches our hearts, circumcises them to be set apart, to be filled to live in reality of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.